Hi, welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today I'm going to be talking about facilities planning, where it happens. To effectively plan how to use a new facility, or if you're upgrading a current facility, you have to go beyond simply looking at square footage and pricing. If you're going to be managing or helping develop the new facility, there are so many factors to think about. Materials, how they'll be stored and retrieved, equipment, people, the local economy, permits and safety, and then there's all sorts of tools you can use to help manage these things. My videos will vary in broadness. Sometimes I'm focusing on a lot of math, a lot of practical tools. Other times I'm just giving a high level overview, and most videos have a combination of the two. For facilities planning, this is going to be a very high level video where I just ask a lot of questions because warehouses, manufacturing floors, facilities can vary so much and there's so many different things involved. This video is just taking a high look at some of the things you need to consider. It's going to vary facility to facility, but let's dive in. First and foremost, what kind of materials will be processed through your facility? If you have a warehouse, a distribution center, a manufacturing plant, there is a reason you have that space. Either you're making something or passing something through it. Nowadays, it's not even a guarantee people will be there, but you can be pretty sure there's going to be materials of some sort. Are they large? Are we talking bigger than a semi-truck? Are they small? You can fit them in the palm of your hand. Are they both large and small? And in terms of that, what is the fill rate? Are these small things, but you don't have a lot of them? Like maybe diamonds, they're very valuable. Are these big things you process all the time, like giant pieces of plastic that are cheap? You can see how these questions will begin to form the kind of space you need. If you're processing diamonds, you probably don't need a large facility, but you want it to be well lit and you want people to handle them with care. If you're processing giant plastic pieces the size of a truck or a plane, but they're super cheap, you just want a lot of space. Maybe it doesn't have to be well protected. You just need something to not get rain on your materials. In that case, a big, cheap warehouse is your best bet, or as cheap a warehouse as you can find. Are the materials shaped in a weird way? That means you have to get special equipment or handle them specifically. Do you need to alter the doors in the facility? Do your goods have to be stored in certain temperatures, like produce, or have certain humidity requirements? Maybe the material has to be above 60% humidity or it loses integrity. If that's the case, keeping the humidity in your location is key and you want to put extra care into that to mitigate that risk. Do your materials expire? First in first out is almost always a good approach to handling material, but if expiration is a key item, you have to focus on lead times and how much you're buying at once. You don't want something expiring in your plant before you can sell it and make a profit. Again, are these expensive or cheap items? How quickly are you selling them? Maybe it's not worth it having too many on hand. Where are your suppliers at? Are you getting these from down the street? Are you getting them from around the world? You can see how all these questions about materials will lead into other categories, like the equipment you need to handle the materials, permits and safety for the materials, storage requirements, maybe you need special people. Even the size of the facility revolves around the materials you are processing through it. Because this is related to your materials, and I touched on some of these already, I'll breeze through this section really quickly. But stemming from your materials, how will they be stored? and how will you retrieve them? It seems like a really basic idea. Oh, we just buy things in boxes, we'll cut the boxes open. But when you get into very precise, high-end, fast systems, storage is very important. Are your materials stored in bins that have open tops? Are the containers locked? Do you have the same material but in multiple locations? Does each production area have the materials it needs? How are the items being retrieved? by human workers, by a machine, by both. Maybe you're running a distribution center where there's a sorting machine that moves packages destined for different locations to different lines, or packages of different sizes to different lines. You can see how safety would be a concern with a machine like this, but also speed. How fast is your machine running? Can your workers keep up with it? Do you need special maintenance workers to see to the needs of this machine? Are your materials clearly labeled? 
This is huge for safety, but also for efficiency. If you have a repair shop inside your facility and all the materials they use to make repairs are just stored in dusty cardboard boxes, it's going to take them a little while to learn where everything is or to pull it correctly. Even your most senior repair person might grab the wrong box at first accidentally. That's wasted time. What kind of equipment do you need to handle your materials and assist your workers? Again, big equipment for big materials? Does that make the equipment expensive? Can you only buy a single piece of equipment that handles all your materials? Or can you buy a bunch of cheap equipment that gets replaced easily? And what about using this equipment? Is it something someone can be trained on relatively quickly? Someone off the streets can just learn how to operate this equipment? Or does someone need to go through a certificate program and months of training just to use this piece of equipment? Can your equipment easily damage your materials? Maybe you need special containers to protect your materials. Maybe you need to slow down your forklifts because your operators keep running into pallets of materials with them. Do you even need machines in the first place? It's always good to take a step back and ask the more broad questions. If you do get machines, will you buy the machines outright and full, or will you just rent them? Forklifts are a very popular machine in industry, and a lot of times you'll see them rented because there's a lot of benefits that come with it. It's less money up front, they're maintained by the forklift manufacturer, and oftentimes it's an adjustable contract where you could get less forklifts one month or one year. You can more easily change the amount, whereas if you bought them up front, you would have to sell the ones you bought and didn't need. What kind of people will be working in your facility? As someone who's planning a new facility or upgrading an existing one, you may have some control over the people that work in that facility. And it's so easy to forget that people are a resource in their own right. Even for someone who's very operations-minded, you can forget that people have different skill sets, different strengths and weaknesses, even different cultures will contribute to how the workforce operates. Different countries have different minimum wage laws, or even what a good wage is considered for a certain position. Even within a country, Different states or provinces or counties can have different rules. Are you hiring for jobs that have a higher turnover rate? If that's the case, your hiring cycle has to be much more frequent. You hire 10 people in, you might expect three of them to be gone by the end of the year, or five of them to be gone in a month. So this is going to affect how you orient your training program and benefits package to either retain those people or let them go more easily. And it does sound weird to say, let people go more easily. You never want to let people go. But if you find that you have a three-month bonus and people are frequently working three months then leaving, maybe you want to push that back to six months or a year. Of course you want to investigate why these people are leaving in the first place, but changing those benefits around, changing those positions around can affect your turnover rate. Experience versus education. Is this the kind of job where 10 years of experience outweighs 4 years of education and 2 years of experience? Or is this something where education is so critical? If you're having a bunch of CMC operators who need to know a little bit of programming and how to run the machine, maybe education is more important than experience up front. But then what do you do if someone walks through the door with 30 years experience on that machine but no education? How do you compare that to someone with a 4 year degree? Those people in advanced positions, are they mentoring the younger people? Maybe you live in an area where there's a larger older population and a larger younger population. You're going to run into an issue where a lot of your workers start retiring and maybe your younger employees don't have the skill set yet. In that case, you really have to focus on mentorship programs. If a position is hard to fill, are you cross-training other people so they can fill in for that person when they're sick or on vacation? What if that person quits? Does a vital part of your business fail? Can you contract out what positions you don't have easily? What kind of premium is involved with that? It's important to consider the local economy, any certifications you might need, and of course, never forget safety. Your local district, your local city, will often give incentives for new businesses to come into the area, or oftentimes will have strict taxes and regulations in place that make it difficult for certain types of businesses to operate locally. Scoping these things out beforehand can give your business a serious advantage. For example, building permits are often needed for repair or improvement projects even. 
based on the cost of the project and items being repaired or improved, like plumbing systems or load-bearing components. Even homeowners who just own a family home sometimes will have to get building permits for these things. Did you know sometimes you need a fire department permit? It might be needed if you deal with flammable material. And again, that would be a great reason to consider safety. Or if your building is open to the public, what's your capacity? Sometimes when you go to a restaurant, you see the max capacity sign from the local fire department. These are things to consider. Some counties, cities, local districts even have air and water pollution permits that you have to obtain in order to do business. And for some permits, just getting one isn't enough. You have to get one for your local district, one for the city, one for the state, maybe even a national level one. So just don't assume it's one and done. I'll end this video by giving an overview of a few tools that will help you better handle the development or improvement of new or existing facilities. And I have other videos that go more in depth on these topics. But first off is project management. Considering all the different components and people involved in a facility, you're going to have to develop some good project management skills. And so much of what you're working on when involved with facilities has to do with the time it's going to take to complete the upgrade or development and all the activities involved. So I would say these tools are some of the most critical ones to learn and apply. First off, we have the Gantt chart. This is a block chart that lists the items to complete and the time expected to complete them as different length bars. It will also show the general relationships between your tasks based on the ending and beginning of the bars. If you have one bar that doesn't begin until another one ends, then that first item must be completed before you can move on to the second one. Now beyond the Gantt chart, many people prefer a PERT chart. PERT is an acronym that stands for Program Evaluation and Review Technique. It's similar to the Gantt chart because it tracks the activities that need to be completed to ensure successful completion of a project. Although it uses a variety of circles connected with lines that have activity and time labels. With both your Gantt chart and your PERT chart, what really matters is the critical path. That's the time it takes to be able to complete all activities. So it's important to know how long each activity takes, how they are related sequentially, and what activities can be done in parallel, meaning at the same time. Because if you're not effectively managing a project, say for example you were to do every activity one after another, something that might only take eight months could easily take three years. So you have to know which activities must be sequential, so you have to do one before the other, and which activities can be done in parallel at the same time. Besides project management, what are some other tools? Well, if you find yourself in charge of handling the installation or upgrade of a facility, how do you keep it all straight other than project management? Well, you have to manage people who know what they're doing. So hire the right people. Seems like a no-brainer, but sometimes it's not always obvious. If you're not a project manager, hire a certified one. Hire consultants to help you with local certifications and, and contractors for building, lawyers to cross legal hurdles, industrial engineers if it's going to be a process-heavy operation. Draft up layout plans of what the floor will look like. Does that seem right to you? Do you have enough room for your people and your equipment? What do the engineers say? What does the electrician say? Does the map of what you're trying to do make sense? These are called reality checks for a reason. Sometimes you get so into the weeds and so involved with these equations, you don't step back and just say, will this work? Imagine yourself in this space. One thing that's useful is to go one step further and actually mimic the positions of items or machines in the actual space with cardboard. Have yourself and your management team pretend you're working in that space and moving around. Is there anything you notice going through the motions? It seems ridiculous, but once you're actually in that space or in a simulated space, you're going to pick up on little things that you wouldn't pick up on otherwise until you actually have the machines and people in place, which oftentimes is too late. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know compared to a lot of my videos, this was a lot of questions and just overviews of different complex topics, but with something as broad and complex as facilities management, you have to start with the right questions. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe. Have a great day.